1, 2, 3, okay. Hello everyone, my name is Maciej. I work in Wire in Berlin. Uh, we are doing this encrypted secure messenger and we use Scala on Android. Uh, but today's talk will not be about that. Um, the talk will be about something called cellular automata, which is a way to model complex distributed computations. But it's not a library, it's uh, not, a, not a framework, you will not be able to do something useful with it immediately. Uh, it's a concept in uh, computer science, so just maybe one day when you design your project, you will just think, aha, this is something that I can use as well but it needs some work from you. Um, we will talk for a moment, in a moment, uh, what are cellular automata in detail, or we'll talk uh, what's the uh, history of that in computer science, and what are the practical uh, usage of it. But um, practical usages are kind of complex, and I don't uh, have time to talk about it uh, in 40 minutes, so we will more focus on simpler examples, because solar automata can also be used for something fun and pretty, just to generate some trippy uh, paintings on the screen. So there will be Conway's Game of Life, which is like the for the first, the most important uh, cellular automaton and not talk about cellular automata can be done without mentioning it. There will be Langton Sand, another example, and Langton Sand, if we apply some modifications and make it colorful, it can create some interesting uh, pictures. Uh, then I would like to tell you something about connection between cellular automata and artificial intelligence. And if we have time, there will be one more example connected to that. Okay, um, so what exactly are cellular automata? Um, in a way, we can say that this is, um, we can complex processes by breaking them into sets of rules applied again and again over time on data spread over a like the discrete board of cells. So we, we have something very complex, but there is a way to make it simpler, but iterative, we can do it with cellular automata. We need five things for that. We need a cell, which is like a data structure, in, and in Scala, this will be a case class. Uh, we need a board, which is like uh, a collection of cells, but it's also a structure in space. So uh, in case of Scala, that will be a map of positions on the board, on two-dimensional board, two cells themselves. A map does not necessarily have to be two-dimensional. I will come back to it in a moment. Um, there is a concept of neighborhood. A neighborhood is if we have a central cell and there are data in central cell and we want to uh, compute the data for that central cell, then we can access the data of the cells around it. So two classical ways to do it, two classical neighborhoods are von Neumann uh, neighborhood, which is like we have a cell on a two-dimensional board and we have cells up, down, left and right of it. And there's a Moore neighborhood, which is like all eight cells around it. But uh, boards can be also three-dimensional, can be multi-dimensional. This is anything that has any space, and also a cell does not have to be square. It can be, for example, hexagonal boards are kind of interesting and popular. Um, so yeah, we have this concept of neighborhood, which in Scala will be a function from a cell to a map of other cells that are in the neighborhood and their distinctive positions. Um, and this is important because it means that cellular automata work on local data. We don't have to access something that is very far away. Um, there are rules also. Uh, rules are simply functions from a cell to a cell. Um, a cell itself is immutable, which, is, which also in Scala makes it easier to use. But uh, we are taking the cell, we are taking the neighborhood of that cell, but we can take that neighborhood from the cell itself, and we create a new updated version of that cell with some new data. And then we want to take that data and apply the same rules again and again and again. So we need some kind of a loop in case of Scala, that will be just iterator over the whole map. Um, yeah, uh, so that's exactly it. That's the, the basics. Um, the history is a bit more complicated. The grandfather of cellular automaton is John von Neumann. John von Neumann is a guy who invented quite a lot of computer science just after the war in the 40s. 
um, he uh, had this idea that we can have like a factory of robots and the robots can take resources from the environment and they can create their own copies and those copies of the robots can create their own copies taking the resources and moving around. Um, this was clearly uh, inspired by petri dishes and microbes moving around in petri dishes, eating some resources, multiplying and so on. And since he was John Neumann, then he, when he pitched this idea, he wasn't ignored immediately. But anyway, for mathematicians, the this was more, more like chemistry, and for mathematicians, we would like to have something that is more well-defined, maybe not simplified, but more abstract. So John von Neumann used some time to create some definitions and theorems, but he died soon after. And only uh, a few decades later, another guy, Stefan Wolfram, who is pretty active and alive still, um, picked up that idea and, um, like, advanced, uh, developed more about it. He uh, mainly focused on the one-dimensional solar automata, which you might see somewhere. This is this triangle here. It's called Sher Sherpinski's Triangle. And, um, well, it's not a board. It's one-dimensional solar automaton means that the board is just a line, and we, every cell has only two neighbors, to the left and to the right. And in case of Stefan Wolfram's um, ideas, uh, the cell itself has only one Boolean of data, so it can be either white or black, and it can change its um, data um, looking at these two neighbors, to the left and to the right. So in this case, the triangle is created like that, that we have this one line board horizontally, but vertically it's time. So we can see that the triangle unfolds on over the iterations. Um, Wolfram created a set of rules like these uh, that say that if we have, for example, only one cell, the central cell, and there are uh, which is black, and there are two cells uh, around it which are white, then in the next iterations that cell will stay black, and if that if the cell is white, but there is a neighbor which is black, the cell in the next iteration will be black as well. But if then we go to the next iteration, and if we have three cells and the central cell is black, then in the even next iteration, that cell will be white. Um, yeah, so generally looking at it this way, he created some naming conventions and classifications. He noticed that most of the uh, cellular automata like this are pretty boring and stable. There are some cellular automatons that are chaotic, they just make a mess on the board and nothing interesting comes out of it. But somewhere in the middle, between them, there is uh, like uh, this interesting part that is both chaotic and stable. There are patterns which are um, Unfo which unfold chaotically, but then they mm, come to the moment of stability, but not a perfect stability, then they unfold again. And we can use that for computation, for, for something like artificial intelligence. Um, okay, but what are practical um, implications of, of all that? First of all, if you ever looked at the weather and asked yourself, okay, will it be raining in Lausanne for the whole week? It won't, probably. Um, then that somewhere there, under the whole forecasting, there is probably a model that looks a bit like, like this, like cellular automaton, only more complicated. We have our planet, but we don't have like a one single equation that can tell us about the weather on the whole planet. Instead, we divide the planet into smaller cells, three-dimensional, sort of, and in every cell, we have some physical processes. We have atmosphere, we have some land and water, we have, the, uh, we have sun, which warms all this, we have some uh, wind conditions and so on. And this is not magic, we exactly know from physics how it works, how uh, this will change over time, so we can take the, this data in one cell, we can apply the rules, the, the physics, and we can also look at the uh, cells around it to create an updated version of our cell. And then again and again, iterating over this, we at some point cr create our forecast of the weather in the next day, next Tuesday. Uh, apart from weather forecasting, um, 
cellular automata can be used for modeling physical laws. For example, uh, dynamics of fluids is, are pretty complicated somehow. Uh, we can simulate all things that are somehow related to real world, that have space. If we have a, uh, if we have a planet, or we have an ecosystem, or we have some kind of an economy, and um, then we have some rules that are local, because in the real world, things that do not happen uh, immediately everywhere. They, if something happens in one place, then it's only slowly propagated over the whole system. Then we can use cellular automata uh, to simulate that. Uh, we can, of course, also use that for microbiomes. That's called artificial life, and it's like going full circle from uh, microbes which inspired cellular automata. Sorry. We can use uh, it also for some kind of a low level artificial intelligence. I will come back to it later. But uh, one more thing is that we can generate data for, or with cellular automata. Uh, this is used in encryption, but it can also be used simply to create something that looks nice. Um, all right. Uh, the game of life was invented by this guy, uh, John Conway, who is a professor emeritus in Princeton, I think. And uh, it's important because it's like the simplest version of, uh, of a cellular automaton, which is still the interesting kind. It's not stable, it's not chaotic, it creates patterns. So the idea is like this. We have a cell, which can be also, we have only one boolean of data. We can, uh, we, it can be alive or dead. We have a board, which is like a typical two-dimensional board. Uh, in fact, in the 70s, the first game of life was played on the board of trackers, not on a computer. We have the most neighborhood, so for a given cell, we have eight cells around it which form the neighborhood, and the rules go like that. If the cell is dead, that is white, but in the neighborhood we have three cells that are alive, then the next, in the next iteration, that central cell will be alive. If the cell is alive, and in the neighborhood we have two or three cells that are alive as well, then the cell will stay alive in the next, next iteration. Otherwise, the cell will die, either because of like it's crowded too much or it's too lonely. And this is where I show you the first example. Da -da -da, game of life. Yeah. So we can create some, populate the board first, because if the board is only white, then nothing really interesting ha is happening. But if we add some black that is live cells on it, it will go like this. We, have, we can see that we have some uh, stable things. For example, we can see that uh, this part is just flipping around from one uh, shape to another, but nothing really happens. We can see that we have some chaos here. We don't really know what will happen in the next few iterations about it. But we also have something very interesting. This is uh, called a glider. A glider is moving around like this. Uh, it's not really existing. Like it's, a, it's cells that are flipping from white to, to black, and we only see it as an object, but it's, really, but it's stable, but dynamic. And then it hits something, and bam, okay, it just disappeared. Anyway, we can see that we have still some chaotic part of the screen. It moves. And that's basically all here. Um, going back to the... Oh, why did it? Why did it? All right. Um, okay, let's go back to this now. Okay, so how to? How can we do it in Scala? Um, we have it. We just have to implement uh, all those things: a cell, a board, the neighborhood, the rules. Um, we have a case class, Game of Life, which takes a boolean, um, and it well, it also has to have an access to the board. But the problem is the board also has to have an access to itself. So we can't create a cell which already know about the board, which is not yet created. It's like an egg and chicken problem. We can go around it by making it more lazy. Instead of having 
the file, uh, giving the file the reference to the board, we can give it information about its own position on the board, and we can give it a function because we need that reference to the board to find the neighborhood, the more neighborhood. But if we simply give a function that will find a another file on the board, then we don't really need the board yet. We will need the board only in the moment of looking for that file. Um, and that works. We can go around the the eager the, the problem. Um, so then we need a method which is which I called update. The method implements the rules um, which are above, and on the we need a class board which takes the dimension. We need to know how big the board is, and it takes a map of uh, from some identifiers to the cells game of life. And for that, we need, and in that board, we implement the find cell method, and we uh, implement a method that will create a new board from the existing one, depending on all the rules. Um, the thing is, I told you before that the map is um, only from positions to the game of life, but to the to the cells. But uh, let's think about it a bit. Um, they can't be really one to one. A position is not really an identifier. Um, and that's why, because um, we have a board like this. And if we talk about a cell in the middle of the board, then OK, we have all the eight neighbors around it. But what happens if we talk about a, a cell which is on the edge or in the corner? That's like literally a corner case here. Um, such cell has only three neighbors, and we would either need to do some corner cases uh, rules exactly for those cells, or we need to change the board somehow. For example, we can make it into, um, like we talked before, into a planet. If we have a um, if we can wrap around our board, then uh, when, we the, uh, when we talk about a board on the left and we want to take a neighbor from even more to the left than this one, then we simply go around and we take the neighbor from the most right position and vice versa. The problem is on the poles, that the poles still can't have this, so we, we still can't move from the most northern, most upper, uh, on the, um, on, from this position to this position. But in case of our uh, cellular automaton board, we can do it again. We can wrap it again. We can create something that is called a torus, which looks like this donut here. And, um, and this way, we have the possibility to move both ways, either horizontally and vertically, and there is no uh, corner cases anymore. Um, well, there are no planets that look like this in reality, uh, but um, it, it is used sometimes in video games. I think in Ultima Online, I think I saw a mod to Civilization, and this is basically because of that. We don't, if we use a board like this in a game, we don't need corner cases. Uh, so, right, we have a board. The board is I'm calling its next method to create the, another board and another board and so on over time. And in Scala, that will be an iter iterator. That's simply a class that creates new boards every time the next method is called. Um, so we implement that class. It's simply an iterator over the, uh, the board. And we call it automaton. And for that, we need uh, a dimension, again, the size of the board. We need a function that will uh, take the position of on the board and the function that will, uh, well, that, this is a method, this will be a function that will uh, find another cell on the board based on the position, and that cell will be created from that method. Um, then we also need another method that will create a board from the board we already have. So this will be called apply board in the automaton, and apply board takes the dimension and takes a function that will create cells in that new board. And this is probably the most magical line in the whole project. In the, um, we create a, board, a first initial board by applying this method apply board that takes the dimension and a um, function that creates cells. 
uh, and apply cell takes the position on the board, but it also needs a function that will find cells on the board, and the board is not yet created. This way, uh, we can go around it. This is, this is exactly the, the way. And the rest is pretty trivial. We have the next method, which simply creates a new version of the board. We have a half next for because this is iterator, but it is half next is always true. And then we can do all the things that iterators can do in Scala. All right. Um, so another example here, Langton's end. It was created by Christopher Langton in 86. Um, uh, this is a bit different. If, in case of Game of Life, we had those microbes all over the board. In case of Langton's and we have just like one ant, one cell that is doing something. And so the rules go like this. We have a cell, again, black or white, although in the next version it will be more colorful. We have the direction, like we have if the cell has an ant, then what we are interested in really is just the direction the ant is heading. Um, or it can be none if there is no ant on the cell. The board is again two-dimensional. The neighborhood this time is only von Neumann, so it means that we are only interested in the up, down, left, right positions. All right, and the thing is that uh, now we have two rules, uh, not, not only one. The first rule is about the, um, if the, um, how the ant is moving. And okay, this is a bit complicated on the screen, but basically, if we have a central uh, cell, we are looking for an ant in the neighborhood. If there is an ant in the neighborhood, we are moving the ant to the central cell. And then, depending on the color of that central cell, we either take the ant to uh, turn right if the color is white, or to turn left if the color is black. Otherwise, if there is no ant in the neighborhood, the cell will stay the same. Um, there's also a rule about the color. If there is no ant, then the color stays the same. Otherwise, if we have an ant, then we will uh, change the color of the cell. All right, then Langton's ant. So we start with a simple single place. We just run the whole thing. And Langton's ant is moving into this kind of chaotic pattern, even though the rules are pretty simple. It creates something like a maze. Uh, but we know uh, that after some time, no matter how much, we can even add some other ants on the screen or, other, or some obstacles. If there is enough time, the ant will, at some point, uh, create a stable pattern but dynamic stable pattern, okay? Um, and it will just move like this on a highway, going in one direction until it, until in, it hits something that was already created before. And then again, it will go to the chaotic phase, and at some point, it will go back to, the, to creating that pattern if there is a possibility for that. And all right, let's go back to the to this. Okay. Okay, so how to do it again? Uh, we have a case class, Langton Ant. We have a color, we have a direction. We have a position and, f and we have the, um, the function that will find the neighbor cell. And we have the update method. And this is all that we need, again, to implement that, even though Langton's Ant looks very different from Game of Life. Now, uh, because of that, we can think about um, making it all more abstract. So there are clearly some, kind, some parts of the code that are the same in both cases. Um, so we can create a trait called automaton cell. That is, the thing is, this is a um, lower bound of that automaton cell uh, if itself, because for the function that finds the cell, we need to return the cell itself, not just the trait, because we need to access data of that, ex that cell, either Langton Sound, Game of Life, or whatever. Um, yeah, but all the rest, all the rest is basically the same in both cases, and we can now rewrite the board and rewrite the automaton using the trait 
instead of the particular class. And this is also one thing that, um, this is the first time in my career as a Scala programmer that actually parallel map made a difference because um, for uh, par because all the cells are uh, calculated independently. They don't. There are no race conditions. They don't interact with, with each other. So even changing a simple map to parallel map uh, gave me some like 30 percent of better performance. Um, all right. So all we need now after that change um, is to implement the actual data of the given automaton. In this case, this is the color and the direction. And we need to implement rules in the update method. Um, and let's do that again, this time in colors. So we have, in s this time we have a case class that tells us something about the color of the ant. And we have a bit different case class of the cell that tells us that there can be many ants with many colors. They don't interact with, it, with each other, they just go from the, uh, if they are taken to the uh, central cell, they will just move their way to, to right or left. They are only interested in their own colors, but the colors which stay in the cell can be um, mixed and, um, and give them some, uh, some interesting pattern. Let's now just go here. Okay. So, for example, here we have three yellow ants, one magenta ant. We can add some more. Now there is one cyan ant. And when they come to the same place, like for example here, then the colors mix. So we can have blue and red, and uh, but the ants themselves, they, they just move around as if nothing happened. Uh, although the magenta, one magenta ant, if it uh, goes, uh, it, if it uh, sees another magenta color made by uh, another magenta ant, that will interact, but the color, the ants with different colors stay uh, completely independent. And also, after some time, create their own highways, their own uh, dynamic patterns. Even here we can see that they go through their own their territories. Yeah, something like that. Um, all right, unfortunately, now I will have to go back to the exact place in the presentation. But all right, that's something like this. Yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, using that idea that we have cellular automata that can go through phases, through more chaotic and more stable things, we can think how to use it to, to for like more general purpose uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, imagine that uh, we want to again we want to do some um, uh, forecasting. We have some huge data set with uh, data about the past and the present and how it changed. We can then like divide the whole thing. We can uh, say that we have uh, this represents our past, this represents our present moment, or like more recent past, and um, we get we have some artificial intelligence. We feed the uh, the past data set to the uh, to artificial intelligence, and we get some prediction about the present moment. So, because we already know the present moment, we can then compare the the present and the prediction. We can get some feedback, and we can start uh, teaching the the AI here. Uh, so, next time when we do the same thing, uh, the prediction will be closer to the truth. And when we think that, okay, the prediction is just like the truth, just like the present moment, we can like move the time window and we can feed the AI the present moment and to get some prediction about the future and, well, assume that this is a good prediction. So, if we are talking about Artificial neural networks, uh, that's usually backpropagation uh, in, in work here. We, we use some algorithms that um, tweak the, the neural network into a better production. In cellular automata, that is not possible. Well, if the automaton is uh, complex enough, 
then uh, probably there will be a lot of coefficients. Like uh, we have so much of this, we want to transform it into so much of that, and there will be some coefficient a percent uh, or in another way uh, used in that transformation. And if there are enough, because we have those coefficients, then we can use some kind of a statistical method, like we can use generic algorithms of Monte Carlo that will uh, tweak those coefficients. But quite often, um, in case of cellular automata, all uh, making the, the simulation better uh, requires actually to have better models of how rules work, and that needs actual humans who will uh, sit down and think about those models. Uh, there are some advantages, though. We have better understanding of the underlying processes. We are used to think about the space, and we are used to think about local events, not something very complex and very universal over the whole system. The maths are simple because we just break down all the uh, complex equations into something that can um, work only on our central cell and its neighborhood. The communication is easier because we are talking about things that we can imagine and we can assume that other people imagine it in a similar way than we do. All right, and uh, for example, we can use it in a way that can be um, not so uh, obvious. Um, my, mm, my personal project is uh, to use cellular automata in video game. Um, we can think, like, in a, in, in a normal way, if we have a... a hero who uh, enters a scene, an area, and there are some uh, NPCs uh, the, uh, which are um, controlled by the computer and they want to kill the, the hero and the hero wants to kill those NPCs. Uh, then um, uh, the, every NPC has something like an AI unit attached to it. So we have something like a virtual brain that controls that one, one, one character. But in case if we want to think about it uh, from the uh, cellular automaton point of view, we can think that the whole area is one cellular automaton. In, when there is no hero, no, no person, then uh, the cellular automaton stays stable, but uh, entering the, the area is like adding a new data, changing some cells, and that uh, triggers the cellular automaton into the chaotic state. And given if the rules are good, then the automaton wants to become stable again, and it can do it by killing the hero. Um, what we get for free in this situation is that our NPCs uh, communicate with each other all the time. And in case of like a classical approach, the teamwork between NPCs is usually a very complicated thing. Um, so oh, that's basically it. Uh, this is a uh, link to uh, the place on GitHub where you can uh, see all the code and the documentation of the project. Um, I'm trying to uh, work the same, uh, to do the same in Rust and to make it, in, make it into like a more um, video game approach with Rust. Uh, you can also see because Solar Automaton is like just a concept, it doesn't matter which language you use, so you can also see how it uh, translates in Scala and how is uh, the Rust approach different or similar to it. Uh, for the whole um, presentation, I used a book by Andrew Ulachinski, Solar Automata, A Discrete Universe. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me off wire, if you use wire. Um, yeah, so these are the handles. And thank you very much. That's it. Questions? Questions? Oh. How did you make the presentation? Yes. <laughs> okay. If you want to want, uh, know more, this is called VideoScribe. It's uh, usually used for shorter educational videos on YouTube, but as you can see, uh, something like this is also possible.
Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.